Everybody. Welcome to Trust Relations, the podcast. I'm here with April, the founder of Trust Relations and the doyen of all things public relations. <laughs> and of course, we're joined by the wonderful Hamish, our marketing lead and expert in the space, who I like to call my marketing other half. Hmm. <laughs> we're tackling some of the biggest topics in news and integrated marketing and learning from the mistakes that make headlines or sink brands. So join us as we have a chat about what works, what doesn't, and what we have to say about all of it. Hamish! Good morning, everybody. Good morning, April. (laughs) For everyone listening, we made Hamish get up at 6.30 a.m., so it might take about 30 minutes into the podcast before he's with us fully. To be fair, you made me get up before 6.30 a.m. Otherwise, I'd still be sleeping. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah, it's but, all good. I mean, they, they say the early bird catches the worm. It's all part of my plan to try to catch him at word of the day because I got to catch up. I have a lot of points. <sighs> I see what's happening here. So I we're just, see what's next time here. we record, it's going to be five in the morning. <laughs> You're yes. the, Do you want to just recount everybody the score? I mean, you, why don't you run the score this I week? I mean, I don't, but you do. So why don't you do it? Yeah, you, you, you are on five. You are on five. You have come ahead leaps and bounds. I am and on. I'm on nearly double that. What are I'm you on nine? nine? Yeah. Jerk. <laughs> and but that everybody it, has been the episode. Thank you for tuning in. I'm leading. Now, I'm going to quit now. Goodbye. Now, Thank you now for tuning I, in. Now I know why. It's because he puts Wordle and Quirtle. Quirtle and Wordle. Yeah. What's the difference between Quirtle and Wordle? Is, and is it Quirtle or Quartle? I've been having this debate with people. I think they're saying it's. Quartle. And I'm like, it's Quirtle. Anyway, uh, there's another debate. Uh, Quartle is... Tomato, Quirtle. tomato. Yeah, that, that one's an easy one. I mean, <laughs> tomato. Tomato. And tomato, to, exactly, tomato. <laughs> here's, here's one for you. Here's one for you. You know, um, you have strawberries and uh, blueberries and etc. You know the one that starts with boys? How do you say that one? Boysenberry? Yeah, okay. My sample size of one has proved the other person's point. So, yeah, I was saying boysenberry. And they're like, boys and what? And I was like, boysenberry. They're like, no, boysenberry. I'm like, yeah, that's what I said. So, anyway, I yeah, think I just ran. You're saying you're like burry. giving You're giving it like a, a morose, you know, cemetery vibe. It's like berry, mm. not bur- yeah. burry. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, and morose. <laughs> I mean, no, maybe, I like maybe, maybe if you eat them in a cemetery, then they're boysenberry. Yeah. Boysenberry. All right. So you're telling me I'm saying it wrong too. <laughs> yes. Wow. This is how it's going to be today. <laughs> what was the quirtle that you got the other day? You were so proud the of The quirtle, I was more, I was very impressed. I didn't realize when I shared that uh, it didn't show why I was happy because I got uh, all four word puzzles out within six moves. Oh, Wow. Yeah, so you I get see. nine moves on that one, and I got it on six, and I was like, well, that was pretty bloody good. I wanted to pat myself on the back. I was self-congratulatory, yeah. I think, I think that's good, as long as you don't do it every day. I think, like, I think you could post stuff, like, same with food pictures. I'm a fan of the occasional food picture, but everyday food picture, no thank you. No, no I don't. And what about sunsets? Because I post a lot of sunsets. I can't stop with the sunsets. That's all I do. Yeah. Sunsets and pets, that's all I post. Yeah, no, pets not so much. I like pets. I have, mind you, I saw a photo of my my smallest dog from two years ago when she was a puppy the other day. Oh, she was gorgeous. I didn't realize how small she was. And now she's. Oh, I know. It makes me sad when it. I'm also happy, but you see those photos. Yeah, my funniest pet photo ever posted on Instagram or Facebook was when I had three rabbits, and they were all they were long lop-eared. Paul and Lop mm. bunnies. Mm. Yep. And for some reason they were doing uh they were humping each other in a train. So there was one and then the second one was humping it and the third one was humping it. And yeah. Sunny, Sunny had just gotten fixed and had <laughs> a cone had a cone on her head. <laughs> yeah. And she was looking in the garden at the three bunnies all in a row humping each other with the mm. cone on her head. <laughs> 
It's a, it would have been an entertaining photo. I don't think it gets funnier than that. So anybody who's a Facebook friend, go scroll through my Facebook. Yeah, page. I'm going to have to go back and find that one. It's quite, it's quite, it, it, re, it came up. I was reminded recently by Facebook, you know, how it reminds you of these memories from seven years ago or whatever. It was like, yeah, so. No. Hi, everyone. This is your show producer, Veronica, dialing in with today's communications buzzwords. April's word is misnomer, and for Hamish, the word is ballyhoo. Happy listening. And what's been happening with you? Regalus. I've been trying not to have a meltdown over the TEDx talk that I'm recording on Friday. Everybody, TEDx talker on on uh, camera and on the mic this morning. <laughs> By the time you listen to this, she's done her TEDx talk. And I've survived, hopefully. Yeah, or well, you, otherwise, so. you're never going to have another podcast. <laughs> 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 this is the end yeah. of the Trust Relations the Podcast. We had three or four episodes, and then April had a meltdown. Yeah, yeah that's a lot of ballyhoo about all the stuff we're doing, and then she dies on us. And then uh, <laughs> did TEDx talk and died on stage. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. Well, I think that today uh, an interesting one to discuss is uh, something that spans both our countries. It's a CEO from Australia who is heading up tech company Fast, which has just uh, shut down. Fast was the one click, one payment uh, option that had raised hundreds of millions of dollars since 2019 and has recently shuttered its doors because it's not got enough money to really go on. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting one, I think, April, because it's uh, it's raised um, 102 million dollars in funding last year alone, and it was looking to raise more cash that would put it at unicorn status. And One it had only generated about 600 thousand dollars in revenue last year. So it's not really a surprise, I think, when you look at many aspects of it. But that's just the the, the recap. Um, what did you think? I've got I've got some thoughts, observations, and otherwise, but. Um, well, so it, they said that uh, several rank and file workers who the company referred to as fastronauts. I know it wasn't that a good one. <laughs> good portmanteau, that one. They, they told NPR that they noticed that he was pouring significant money into deals aimed at creating marketing buzz, like partnerships with sports teams. Mm -hmm. But that yeah, they weren't sure what the benefits were. Well, yeah, there was a, a video that he posted on his own Instagram account of him uh, just doing donuts in a uh, NASCAR with the driver and uh, just to talk about his sponsorship, jumps out of the car, puts on his uh, salmon blazer and walks away. Uh, you know, you, you've got to wonder, how does that help generate the right type of buzz about your brand that is going to generate cash flow at the point that it matters? I don't know. I, 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 well, because yeah. Race yes. cars are fast, like the name of the company. Oh, God, how did I miss that? You're right. Okay, I'll take it all back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't not... I mean, there's a lot more to it. And I read an interesting article yesterday, actually, about it, where uh, someone who works in the startup space said that uh, it's it seems to be the rise at the moment of uh, companies that are all about the, uh, the buzz and not a lot about the substance. And uh, as the analogy was in this article, it's, uh, it's like building the wave and then trying to find a way to put water underneath it. And I thought that's a, an interesting way to view it. And it seems, you know, to, to fit in this instance um, with, you know, what's happened over there at Fast. And it did make me think as well of uh, a couple of other big, high-profile brands that were similar in terms of a fire festival. We work. It is really interesting to see that that level of charisma when people have that kind of gravitational pull and it, it inspires people to want to follow them. The amount of things that they can do for a long stretch of time before anybody notices that what they're doing is hollow. Mm. I mean, it's, it happens with religion and it happens with companies, right? You just get people following mm. big personalities that give them hope i think that's probably what we're seeing here mm. did you ever see lula rich 
No, I haven't. Oh, it's a great one. Definitely worth yeah. watching. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a great, great documentary. What's funny also is it reminded me of our conversation yesterday with our client when we were going through that branding exercise. Mm. And they and they were joking how they wanted to put out a fake press release about getting a bunch of funding because then mm. everyone would care. <laughs> <laughs> Can we do an April Fool's press release saying that we that we got sixty million in funding? So there is something weird. I think it's a story about perception becoming reality, which mm. is exactly what marketing is. But it's also a story about how when perception creating reality leads to mm. craziness or eventually it'll, you'll be found out and then you have a documentary on Netflix called Inventing Anna. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or The Twindler. And what's the, the Twindler? Uh, the Twindler the Swindler. That's it. Thank you. Yes, the brain's coming slowly out of retirement. Welcome back. Good morning. Yeah, thank you. Where are we? What time is it? <laughs> um, but it's also like the... Elizabeth Holmes Theranos saga, uh, where she was very charismatic. She talked a big game. Mm. She was able to you know, excite people and then was found by a jury of her peers to have been guilty of defrauding investors out of hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, WeWork, which had money all around the world and offices, you know, similar, maybe not defrauding, but big visions, big plans, no substance. Um, mm. And it really does go to show in this instance the dark side of marketing to some extent where you can That's market right. and if people don't do their due diligence, that's a tongue twister, uh, do their due diligence, mm -hmm. that you can get caught out. And, you know, mm -hmm. I guess it doesn't matter what you do, you, unscrupulous people will traverse all industries, but it does show that marketing is a powerful tool. It can be used for good or evil. Yeah, well, like anything. I guess it comes back to what we've spoken about in last podcast and, you know, the, what we offer as part of our onboarding process is this whole message cohesion. You know, you've got to make sure that what you're saying can be verified and backed up so that when the proverbial sh hits the fan, you actually can say, no, 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 this is legit. Here's why. And this is all uh, above board. So right. uh, I think... You know, in this instance, the messaging was more about what can we do? How do we get some money? More money? I want to go in a fast car. And here we are <laughs> talking we about him and laughing at him. I like, I, mean, I like that. I like that the voice. That was the funniest yeah. part. Not necessarily in a fast car. <laughs> Hello, got lots of money. I want to go in a fast car. <laughs> okay. Can we cut this? <laughs> Let's no, go I back. love it. That's staying in. <laughs> We're going back. <laughs> Fast, the takeaway there is substance wins over uh, sizzle. I think that it's a in this very instance, good summation. Thank you. Thank you. I think if you don't have something as a product which is verified and actually starting to generate an income and you've got a very charismatic person up front who's leading the sales, investors are going to start taking note and asking harder questions. And so these brands that want to reach that unicorn status have to just have the substance to back it up all right shall we move on to our next segment yeah which one know. are you picking let's pick marketing conundrums so in this segment we're going to discuss a recent marketing conundrum we've encountered and hash out some possible solutions mm -hmm. today we're discussing how brands often don't know their archetypes or what they stand for mm. And yes. this can drive inefficient communications. Uh, where do we want to start with that? I guess archetypes of people uh, who don't know. Uh, these, these 12 personalities, shall we call them, that have uh, been derived from uh, Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud's work in understanding the personality types of humans and has been uh, co-opted into the, the marketing and business sphere. Uh, to explain how businesses present themselves out to market and how they're perceived potentially. And there's, as I say, 12 segments uh, broken into four quadrants of related categories, which have three uh, related um, archetypes within them. And, uh, you know, there's such wonderful titles as uh, the hero, the jester, the everyman, the creator, the innocent. And each one of them depicts how the brand positions itself and is perceived in the market and then 
knowing this, how they can then leverage what they're saying in a way which is going to resonate and be cohesive with what the market's expecting and how they, you know, they need to come across. Mm -hmm. And what are the purposes of the, I mean, I, I know this, but just for the audience, what are the purposes of identifying what your archetype is as a brand? The purpose is to, to help, one, help internal teams to understand who the brand is. If you're small, working in a smaller company, it's just as important. But in that case, you might have the owner and a few core team members who know the passion from the owner and where the business has come from, where it's going to. Mm -hmm. And that's great because they can all get on the same page, but it's good to then fine tune that. In a larger company where you have people who come in and you have a bit more of a transient workforce, um, the legacy has been around 40, 50, 100 years, who knows? It's about how is that brand evolving? How is, you know, how is it evolved? How do you get everybody who's potentially working across a broad geography of North America or across the world? How do you get them all on the same page so that they're all understanding who the brand is at its core um, and what it needs to represent? Trust Relations is the magician. Yes. Tell people why. <laughs> I mean, I think that it, it suits us in that we are trying to create things that don't already necessarily exist, have an alchemy to things that where there isn't already an alchemy. So that's probably mm -hmm. the simplest way to say it. I don't know if you want to expand on it based on what you know about the magician. The magician personality, it's about dreaming big and helping those dreams come to fruition in unexpected and sometimes, you know, mystical, I guess you could lean into yeah. the magician personality ways. It, it, it's a really nice one. And I think you, you've nailed it when you said, you know, that's what trust is. But of course it, you do, because you know says, what we are. <laughs> it says the magician archetype makes dreams come true by using knowledge of how the world works. Magicians' brands are transformative and the uh, characteristics are charismatic, healing and driven. Driven, yes, absolutely would agree. I think, you know, and there's a lot of others. I think that the one thing about archetypes, actually, is the names are not always intuitive as to what the archetype means. You know, there's the magician, which we've explained, which, you know, if you were to take a negative lens, might people might think, oh, it's all smoke and mirrors um, with this company, um, which isn't necessarily true. You know, there's the lover. How do you have a lover as a, as a brand? Or how do you have a, a jester? Or a sage, one of your favorite words. But he wishes a sage. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. No, and I think it's somewhat representative of the era that archetypes were founded, you know, the early 1900s, rooted in psychology, wanting it to be probably a bit more palatable and digestible for the wider audience. But uh, I think what they represent still stands true. I think maybe some of those words uh, or titles, I guess they are. The outlaw, I mean, really, who wants to be an outlaw? And I mean, it's all about someone who's innovative, pushes the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Who wants to have those names? So I think sometimes it's about reframing those words and coming up with new names that also resonate. Well, you don't actually say you're, I mean, I, I suffered. No, you're not going out to market. But I'm not actually saying on our website, we're the magician brand, no. Uh, no, it's just, but it's it, informing, it, but it informs the fact that it's purple and that it's about transformation and alchemy. You know, that's yeah, absolutely. And it's all about helping an internal audience understand how you want to project. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that you want to go out there and communications. We are the magicians. <laughs> no, and you know, <laughs> the voice is back. Yeah, that was a different one. Um, <laughs> but you do want to go out there and to your team and make sure that they're on the same page. And so that's why I think sometimes it's important to explain these things, not just say, here, read this, this is what it is. When people understand things, there's a much better chance that they will be able to uh, live that ethos. So, so, yeah. so with that, what happens when brands don't know their archetype and how does that lead to inefficient communications? Inefficient communication will come from it because you have one person saying one thing and someone saying something else. And if you're in an organization where you've got someone who's leading the content on the website and they're presenting grandiose ideas or they're over pitching it, and then someone picks up the phone, calls the sales room or speaks to someone in sales, and they're saying something which is slightly different, 
that cohesion doesn't exist. You actually have a dissonance there. And that dissonance confuses people. It leads them to feel a little bit insecure about a decision they might be making. And, you know, if you're coming back to the dentist, looking to book a new dentist and, you know, you're not feeling like the, this person is the right person for you, you're not going to go. And if you're then looking to buy a car and, you know, it's a big purchase, that means a lot of, lot of money not coming through the door for that organisation based on the fact that there was a lack of cohesion. Of course, you know, there's other things in there, product quality and so on and so forth. But when you look at it, your brand promise should traverse those whole, that, that whole spectrum. It shouldn't just be about the messaging at one point. It should be this point and this point and the delivery of this and the after-sales service and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And if there's tangents running out from the one communication platform and they're saying slightly different things that don't tie together well, that's where you end up with that message inefficiency. And then what do you do when you see this happening to help brands come into alignment? Is it a matter of doing the branding exercise? Is it getting them to figure out what their persona is? What What's the best look, approach? The, the, look, is a brand persona or an archetype essential at the end of a, uh, an exercise? No. Is it essential that everyone's on the same page and that you can get them to understand? Yes. What I think is important is to to sometimes get a third party to have a look at what you're doing. Um, you know, sometimes you're so enmeshed in what you're doing, you can't see the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. So stepping back and doing some exercises where you look at what you know, what your market knows, what are the overlaps, what what are the opportunities, where, you know, where are your pain points, you know, the, the, doing an exercise like the one which we do, the, the, the trust analysis to understand what is working, what is not working, what have you been saying, what do you need people to understand, and then distilling it down. It's this big process, as you know, from the ones we've done. A lot of questions up top, and it distills down towards a pointy end of then who are we as a brand archetype, or if that doesn't fit, because some clients don't love having an archetype, but they do like uh, saying that they're similar to a brand personality. Um, so like before, I said the magician is uh, like Disney Company, some people like going, oh, yeah, we're like Disney. So our brand persona is Disney because we're magical and we're creating things which entertain and which people love to tune in, to, you know, whatever it might be, the words that work for them. So sometimes it's not about saying this is your archetype, but it's about, a similar, uh, about assigning them a brand partner that they can use as the base. Um, and that's what our, as you know, uh, the analysis we do, the trust analysis does. It, it, it helps refine a communication and make sure that everything they're saying can be backed up by facts because when it is backed up by facts, people are singing from the same hymn book and everyone's going to be on, on song. Right, exactly. What was that word? On song. Oh, okay. I thought you used a <laughs> fancy word that I couldn't understand and that was your word of the day. Oh, no, I got my word of the day in uh, half an hour. You ago. did not. Yeah, I did. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh you're the best that's worse um <laughs> i mean i would add to it that i feel like if you don't have that cohesiveness internally as a brand then all of your external communications suffer because you end up not having any any guiding light or any guiding star that's going to explain to the external world and the internal world what it is that your what your mission is right and also mm -hmm. you need those things intact so that you can do things that substantiate what you want people to believe about you so you need to figure out okay what are the things that we need to do to demonstrate that this is important to us mm -hmm. and that's the only way that you can make sure that that storytelling and that story doing align which is the whole point of that trust analysis that, yep. that we were talking about so yes do you want to sum up the brand archetypes for us in in terms of the marketing conundrum takeaway it's very important that brands have a guiding star as in terms of what their persona is. And that mm. is actually what's going to resonate from the inside out. If you don't have that nucleus of the thing that's driving you with that mission and those values intact, it becomes Im almost impossible to have cohesive communications within and without. And then when you don't have that, you also don't have actions that 
can validate or substantiate what it is that you're going for. So you end up having a scattered approach to everything you do. Yeah, so I guess I guess what we're really saying here is um, call us to do a trust analysis to make sure that your brand is cohesive. Um, <laughs> is there one more news thing we want to chat about? So we can talk about the Dunkin' Donuts story <laughs> where Rafael Acevedo, Acevedo, I apologize, it's will be stepping down. There. Beg your pardon? I said there's quite a misnomer there. Acevedo. It is. Acevedo. <laughs> Acevedo. I like that one. That's a good one. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Okay. He's he's stepping down as CMO uh, to pursue other opportunities after a long, I think it was nine months in the job, which throws, I'm going to guess, Duncan back into a bit of disarray given it took him two years to find him and he's lasted a grand total of nine months. Uh, my question is, is the industry, the fast food confectionery-ish industry yeah finding it challenging because it's a non-growth market should we say i wonder that too i mean nine months is that's such a short obviously that's why that's the headline that's such a short time mm. to be but but yeah i mean i it makes me wonder if it's uh, um being driven by people working from home or now post pandemic because Dunkin' was kind of the thing that you would do on the way to work, right? I mean, I know in New York, I used to grab like an egg and cheese and a cup of coffee on my way to the office. And and if mm -hmm. people aren't doing that now, I wonder if they're suffering. This is it. So, it, look, there's a huge part of it, that. But then others like McDonald's have survived. So maybe it's more. Because I know that, I mean, in Australia, and I'm going to guess – in the States, there's been more of a push by McDonald's to offer healthier options on their menu mm -hmm. with, you know, wraps and salads and things like that. Um, so they've moved away from their traditional, what could be viewed as unhealthier foods. You know, it's interesting that, you know, others in the quick service restaurant industry, rather than fast food, I, I mm -hmm. should rescind my earlier comment, pursuing <laughs> CMOs from more diverse backgrounds than they might normally have uh, done. So they're no longer looking in industry for people. Uh, they're looking outside. So I know um, that KFC recently-ish, I can't remember exactly when, appointed um, a CMO who had worked at Nintendo previous to that. Mm -hmm. So really looking to bring in different thinking and different experience to probably shake up an industry that is heavily disrupted at the moment, driven by social and political trends mm -hmm. i think they need a poop emoji ice cream <laughs> yes if you missed the poop emoji chat please tune into last week's podcast it was excellent <laughs> no but there is something to that i mean i and it could also be people leaning into more healthy food options to your i think you were hinting at that before where you know our donuts really the thing that people are eating for breakfast now I found it interesting that you said that they got an egg and cheese. Was that an egg and cheese donut? No, 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 no. They had egg and cheese sandwiches. Okay. That were that were not so bad. They're not as good as the diner ones, but but those New York. I'm diners, not surprised. Or the the New York um, bodegas too, man. They know mm -hmm. how to do egg and cheese. <laughs> not the healthiest breakfast, but it's certainly quick and delicious. Look, yeah, and there's uh, that's what they built their brand on, isn't it? I mean. Mm. Yeah. So I think there's probably a shift away from that to something else. But you're right. It did fuel the the bellies of a lot of people early in the morning, late night, during the day, after school. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's probably a shift away. Um, and we'll see some big changes in that fast server or quick service category um, coming up because I know that there's been a lot of other shifts with new CMOs coming on and shifting the agency of record from, you know, one big brand to another. It will be interesting to see what happens in this category over the next six months. What do you think is the key takeaway from this Duncan CMO departing after just nine months story? I think that the takeaway is the world is changing. Marketing is now realizing that good ideas come from multiple industries. You don't have to have grown up and cut your teeth within an industry to have a fresh, relevant idea. And that the fast service industry is definitely 
rooted in change at the moment and that, mm. uh, you know, a CMO leaving after nine months signals how tough it is at the moment and that boards and the public are looking for something fresh, something new. And if you don't have it, you're going to walk yourself or be walked out that door. Yeah. What about you? Did you take anything else out? I think you covered it. But also just that I think you really have to be innovative and creative, especially if you're in a, a sector that's struggling like that. So to make the cut. Let's move on. Ooh, we got a jingle from Hamish. Can we move <laughs> on to campaign analysis? Campaign analysis of the day. Yes. Skittle apologizes to Sour Lime fans with a press conference run on Twitch. Skittles is kicking off an apology tour targeted at consumers frustrated by the brand's decision to nix its lime-flavored candies in favor of green apple in 2013. Per detail shared in an email with Marketing Dive, lime returned as a permanent offering last fall. So what do you think the likelihood is that people are actually mad about sour lime going away? This much, as people <laughs> can not see on screen. It's goose eggs. Zero. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have to uh, say, it's very clever. Look, it's an interesting, interesting play. Uh, you, you go. I've been doing a lot of talking today. You tell me why. I think that it's very funny to do a press conference on Twitch that sort of, all that, to take it to that serious level, and that mm -hmm. heightens the humor of it because I think everybody understands that it's tongue in cheek and this isn't a real thing. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of like some of the best comedy is what can be really funny is when people are emotionally really connected to something that is they're really really upset about or they're really happy about and the emotion is about something that's irrational or you know yeah ridiculous and so i think that they've kind of leaned into using that comedic effect i think the fact that they're apologizing for something nine years ago is probably the funniest part yes using twitch is also quite entertaining because it obviously speaks very heavily into who they're targeting with their uh, or who their audience is because I'm pretty sure that people from nine years ago are probably not their core audience of skittle leaders anymore and it shows that they're obviously trying to be, maintain relevancy and mm -hmm. they're targeting their audience very cleverly um, but I wonder just as the devil's advocate here are they leaning into this whole bad of emotional confession videos and apology videos that everybody's using at the moment. Is it as novel as we think? Or is it the novel just the angle that they've run in apologizing for something from nine years ago? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, it is it, it, I think I think it's extra funny that they're that they're leaning into something so old. Mm. Yeah. Like it's like this thing that got resurfaced and mm -hmm. they're apologizing for it now is this horrible move on the company's part. Um, yeah. I mean, there is yeah. that does make it extra funny, but I, I, I do agree with you in that it's definitely stunty. And most of the time now I'm not a big fan of stunts because I feel like they read as inauthentic and like yeah. you're trying to manipulate the audience rather <laughs> than doing something that's organically of value. Mm. In the case of Skittles, how do you do something that's authentically of value? It's difficult. Look, yes, it is. And how do you do it on a platform where obviously you've got a core market and do it in a novel way without a gamble? Because, it, it, you know, yeah, I don't know. It, it, I don't, so I don't love it. I mean, I think it's clever. I'm not obsessed with it. I don't think it's the most innovative thing I've ever heard, to your point. Mm. And I don't think it's the most authentic reading thing. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't. Oh, I do. I think it's very true to their personality. I mean, this whole taste the rainbow. Yeah. Uh, it has always been a little bit Silly and colorful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always been irreverent and it's been whimsical. I think this leans into that. So I think it's on. I it's mean, on brand. It is on brand for them in terms of what they have been for the last five, six years. And it is leaning into an audience. But. But it's clearly I, I, a stunt, right? It's clearly a stunt. Yeah. Uh, it's got it's, it's generated media buzz, but will it be memorable? No, because if you're going to buy Skittles, it's not like you can go and say, "I'll have every flavor except for the lime, please." You know, it's it, it's 
do you, yeah. do you ear skittles all the same flavors at once or do you like separate them out <laughs> i mind you i haven't had skittles in years i used to take them and divide them up so i would see how many of each color i had and then i would eat the number i had the most of until they were even and then i would eat them in order of which ones i liked least to best until there were none of how's that ocd of, of yours by the way i know i know it's a little bit wow i know i mean i'm not making fun of anyone with ocd hopefully i don't mean to if i have but that that's very particular way it's of eating. it's very particular yes and part of it and also it's like <laughs> i actually still do that <laughs> don't eat skittles but i have smart sweets oh yes and i'll look and i'll see okay i've got you know four green and red gummy worms and i have like three of the yellow and orange ones and then i'll eat the red one that there's more of the <laughs> <laughs> i'm not laughing at you i don't know when i start i must have done that my <laughs> <laughs> i must have done that my whole life I never realized until this moment how weird it is. Oh, let's not say it's weird. It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> He's like, run, run. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I'm no longer your co-host. Yeah. It's terrifying. What was that? I'm coming. <laughs> uh, look, I think it's what was funny as well, by the way, just as an aside on this. And I don't know if it was a purposeful mistake but uh, didn't uh, did you see that at the end of the um, the article there was a correction issued by marketing dive no so it was an apology on an apology <laughs> correction a previous story misstated the run date of the skittles billboard in times square based on incorrect information provided to marketing dive wait 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 i have to see this so it's like so the article's okay. about an apology Super and then they issued an apology yeah very what is this thing about other Mars Wrigley brands have leveraged social media trends as a springboard for creative ideas. Audio from an old TV ad for berries and cream Starburst went viral on TikTok last year, with users replicating the dance of a creepy little lad character from mm. the spot. Mm. And then Starburst quickly capitalized on the discussion with a little lad Halloween costume and other activations tied to the 15-year-old commercial. So Mars Wrigley apparently has a if they've, they've got a good marketing team. <laughs> they've got a good marketing team. Yes. Mm. Definitely have a good marketing team. Yes. Big company. Big dollars. Mm -hmm. The takeaway for Skittles, I think, is that everything old is new again and that they have really done their homework in identifying who their audience is, where their audience is engaged. And in launching a campaign into it uh, to, to try and boost relevancy and consumption. Um, mm -hmm. My only question on that is whether or not they're leaning in too heavily to the apology sphere of marketing. However, you know, as I said, they're talking to their audience. It might be bringing that brand relevancy back up and that's all they're wanting to do. So overall, pretty good. Pretty good campaign. Yeah. I agree. And I would just say, in general, I'm not a fan of stunts anymore as a rule of thumb. However, I do think in their case, because it's on brand and because they really leaned into the fact that it was a stunt and they were not, I mean, they were kind of tongue in cheek, letting people know that they were goofing. Yeah. I think that it, I think it works. I think that if they had done it without taking it to that level, that it mm. wouldn't, I wouldn't have landed. But I think the fact that they, they went really went for it with this i think i think works because yeah. it's on brand mm -hmm. agreed totally agree so tell me i've got to ask the question did you get your word in yes well done well, what was your word of the day april the word of the day was misnomer a misplied or inappropriate name or designation oh i missed that one I, oh, okay. I, I slid it in. I kind of did it. Did you say it was a bit of a misnomer? I said that was a good misnomer when you were talking about the name of that guy being not the right name. And then yeah, it was funny because I, I mumbled it in Hamish oh. style. And then you said, what did you say? Oh, 
and then I said, I said it again, but you still didn't catch that I sort of just. Uh, oh, when I was saying, oh, when I was saying uh, Esavado. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> well done. Thank you. I was very proud of myself. <laughs> you did really well. Very Actually, well. in full disclosure, I wanted to do the second news story because I realized I hadn't gotten my word of the day in yet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! Like, let's do another news story. <laughs> I think actually the second news story, story, uh, Veronica doesn't need to be in there because it's a little bit of a long episode. So, <laughs> <laughs> so my word of the day is getting cut. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so my word was ballyhoo. Ballyhoo. Mm, a clamorous or vigorous that? attempt to win customers or advance any cause, or it's blatant advertising or publicity. And I remember you using it. It didn't stand out to me. When did you used it in the context of. I said they're making a big ballyhoo about all their marketing and, you know, yeah. it makes sense, et cetera. And it just, just like smooth like butter. Yeah, we go. We did very well today, which brings we us to. We did. Our... Yes, no one all revealed right. anything. So we got six points for you and 10 for me. He's still up by four. But it's not that far ahead. I mean, you only have to catch one of my words. I've got a really... It's so idea. far. Next season, there's a new game that April wins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not competitive here much. Just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. We, but we reserve, uh, it for, we reserve it for buzzword. Otherwise, we're very collaborative. That's right, we are. But then they do say that uh, chaos breeds the best creativity, don't they, April? They do. It's in my talk. Uh, tune in, everybody. You see what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> I did. Just, just totally promo my TEDx talk. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. Hype man. Yeah, love it. Wait, do I get the do I get the hype man like rap yeah. version? Everybody. No. <laughs> did you ever watch? Did you ever watch Dave? Oh, I know it. No, I never did. No. It is no. so bizarre, but so funny. If you need a good laugh, that might be a good, like, okay. not quite okay. as weird as um, Zach Galifianakis. Zach Galif oh my God, I can't say his name. Zach Galifianakis. Thank you. No, no, I'm obsessed with that. Te What's it called? Batches? No. What? Uh, when he's the clown, the rodeo clown. Oh. It's it. it's super weird, but it's like I was obsessed. I loved it. Baskets. Mm. Bas. That's it. It's so good. Have you seen it's Jeff so Who Lives at Home? I think that's what it was called. Yeah, it was just a movie. I was just watching it the other day. It looked entertaining. He cast like Jason Siegel, Ed Helms, Judy Greer, if I did, Susan it's been Sarandon. A long, that's, a, that's an amazing lineup. Yeah, it looked I entertaining. Think I did. I should watch it again. Well, I've made it through April. I've woken up. I'm awake. And uh, I think that was a good good episode so thank he you he was for... only drinking orange juice what happened there's no know. coffee involved this is impressive nothing at all no coffee for a couple of days now so I, wow. i'm back i'm fresh um thank you everybody for tuning in uh remember you can download us and stream us wherever you'd like to listen to your favorite podcasts and if you subscribe and rate and share our show it will keep this awesome content coming your way now one last thing before we sign off Let's not forget about this week's code. Visit the link in the show notes below and use the code TRUSTANALYSIS6 for a chance to win a free trust analysis workshop. New clients qualify and terms and conditions apply. You can check out our webpage for a full rundown of the offer details. I was waiting for you to do the, uh, the terms and conditions in the terms and conditions voice. New What's clients it? qualify and terms and conditions apply. You can check the webpage for a full rundown of the offer details. Okay, you're doing that from now on. It's much better. No, it's not. <laughs> I love it. So stiff and creepy. <laughs> that sounded creepy. It's so, so, so uh, robotic and creepy. Let's go with that. Let's go with that. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> Where, which is actually funny. It reminds me, I, I, uh, I wrote a play and yeah. there, it was performed and I didn't know until it was performed that it was funny. It wasn't, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't meant to be Here's funny. Here's a tragedy. 
This is like Mac I've started after Macbeth and actually it reads like Taming of the Shrew. It wasn't meant to be funny at all. It was like meant to be this heartbreaking, you know, sort of drama. But it and everyone laughed the whole play. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. And then I realized it's actually quite funny, but it was not intended to be. It was only funny because it, it was a ridiculous scenario. And people, the, the characters were so emotionally invested that it just led to this, you know. Oh, good. This. So anyway. Was um, it critically I, acclaimed? No, but it was at a black box theater in New York City. So something, not nothing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs>